Praise the Lord, all you nations. Lift him up, all you peoples. For the Lord is great and mighty. Okay, let's continue looking at God's word again today. I want us to open our Bibles to to 1 Corinthians chapter 4, from verse 1. So let a man so consider us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that they be found faithful. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by human court. In fact, I do not even judge myself. For I know of nothing against myself, yet I am not justified by this. But he who judges me is the Lord. Therefore, judge nothing before the time, until the Lord comes, who will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsels of the heart. Then each one's praise will be from God. Now, again, let's open our Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1. Now, I'm trying to look for where to break. Uh, so, okay, I'm going to read from verse 1, but I'll just jump quickly to where I want, which is verse 12. Just want to use verse for a few verses in the early part to give it context. It said, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, according to the commandment of God our Savior and of Christ Jesus, who is our hope. To Timothy, my true child in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and from Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, like I said, I'll just quickly jump to verse 12. He said, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has strengthened me because he considered me faithful, putting me into service. Or like King James would say, putting me, he committed to me a ministry. He said, even though I was formerly a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent aggressor, yet I was shown mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was more than abundant with the faith and love which we are found in Christ Jesus. Let me just stop reading that uh, verse uh, 14. Now, those are the two portions of the scriptures I want us to start with today. And I have a question I want to ask, something I want everybody to think about, I want everybody to consider, and all right, let's all consider these things in our hearts. Simple question is this, what is the thing that's most important to you in life, really? What is the thing that's really driving you, pushing you? Now, please, let me go back to this thing I teach again and again when I'm explaining things to people, that these days, when people say that God spoke to them, or when they say that, now, let, let me just say this. There are words you, you have to be careful when you use, all right? Don't stop saying God spoke to you. Be very, very careful. Unless you, look, if a scripture was, you know, brightened in your eyes, say it. That scripture came alive to me. Say it like that. Do you understand my point? I had a dream and I understood, say it like that. When you use expressions like God spoke to me, I think we are too flippant with that expression. Everybody says it. When he finishes praying, a thought drops in his heart. He said, God spoke to me. God did not speak to you. Just say, a thought dropped in my heart and I believe it was the Holy Spirit. Are you getting my point? The Spirit of God prompted something in me. Use expressions that are safe. Are you getting what I'm saying? <laughs> Be very careful. Be very careful. Let's just not use God spoke to me anyhow. I'm, I'm, I'm always explaining this. When many times Christians say that the Lord spoke to them, or the Holy Spirit spoke to them, what they are referring to is that the other way they say is that my spirit spoke to me. I heard my spirit. My spirit said, now, I keep on emphasizing the problem with that teaching, okay? You know, it was very popular in Christianity, in World of Faith movement, when I was young, 
that as a young believer on campus those days, we were trained to learn, we were trained to hear our spirits. We were trained to pray until every other thought is silent, and then your spirit can now speak. Now, the concept, this is the principle behind it, is that if you that you have a spirit, well, the idea is that you are a spirit, you have a soul, you live in a body, but the, the summary, we are made up of what? Spirit, soul, and body. And that when you give your life to Christ, that your spirit is born again, regenerated. And that spirit is pure because it's fashioned after God. And many of the scriptures we read, we say it applies to our spirit. When we say that we've been, we, have, we are new creatures in Christ Jesus, we say it's our spirit. Now, so for that reason, if only you can get that spirit to talk, if only you can get that spirit to talk, whatever it says will be clean. They will not say things like, now these are scriptures, the spirit of the Lord, the spirit of a man is a candle of the Lord. Are you getting my point? Aha. Uh-huh. Now, so this is, this is what we derived from all of these thoughts. That if my spirit speaks, it is the will of God. If my spirit speaks, it's exactly what God wants me to do. That is the genesis of many, much of the confusion you have experienced. That's the genesis. Now, those things are not wrong entirely, but they're also not totally accurate. We overlooked some things. The concept that the spirit of a Christian is totally pure is not correct. Because the Bible makes it clear it can be defiled. Paul said, let us do what? Cleanse ourselves of all defilement of flesh and spirit. Spirit can be defiled. That's one problem. Number two, your spirit, there are many sides to it. The word spirit in scriptures has a lot of uses. Has a lot of uses. And the application, when the Bible is applying it, you have to be careful and read the context. So, does the seed of God dwell in the child of God? The answer is yes, it does. But that part of you that the Bible calls spirit, that's not the only thing that is there. That's the mistake we make. Do you understand? We think that is the only thing that is there. That's not the only thing that is there. So, we have a lot of arguments. Like, can a Christian be possessed or be obsessed or be depressed or be, you know, all those kind of things by a demon? We have a lot of hair-splitting arguments over some of those things. They will now say, say things like, uh, an evil spirit cannot get into the spirit of a Christian. I don't know. All I know that Paul said, the spirit can be what? Defiled. That's why he said it needs to be cleansed. He said, let's cleanse ourselves of what? All defilement of flesh and spirit. Why am I emphasizing this? When, now please read the book. I explained it inside there. Guided by the spirit. I just need to emphasize this again. So when a spirit has been defiled, and it speaks, it's as clear and it's the same voice as the one that has not been defiled, and it speaks. I don't know whether you're getting my point. It is spirit talk. So no matter how much you pray and pray until you're quieting your mind, quieting your heart, and your spirit speaks, it doesn't make it clean. It does not mean it is God that has spoken. It does not mean the spirit of God has spoken by force, just because you think you have heard your spirit. That is why many times, at least I've had that experience, Christians will tell me something they want to do and tell me it's their spirit that said they should do it. Before I used to argue, I said, no, your spirit could not have said that. And, of course, they are insistent, it's the, their spirit. But now I realize that I was half wrong. No, they were half wrong too. <laughs> what do I mean by that? <laughs> Did their spirit say it? Possibly. Where, where I, I would, someone like me would have been arguing is that how can your spirit tell you? Because we both agree that if it's your spirit, if it's your spirit it must be speaking from the knowledge communicated from the heavenly uh, presence of God through the Holy Spirit into your spirit. So if your spirit speaks, it should be clean. So when that, that thing is not clean, when it's not in agreement with the word of God that is already recorded for all of us, arguments start and say, no, your spirit could not have spoken. That's why I made my own mistake. But well, later I realized that, no, it is the spirit that spoke. That's where I was half wrong. Where the other fellow was half wrong, and which I, I was also half wrong, is that we both agreed that if indeed it is the spirit, it must be correct. But I learned later, it is not so. It can be wrong. A man's spirit can be wrong within him, and he be a believer. That's why Paul said, cleanse yourself of what? 
defilement of flesh and spirit. Spirit can be defiled. Now, another word that's used in the scriptures, for, uh, another way the word spirit is applied in the Bible is, now that's why I talk about this. What is your goal in life? What is pushing you? What is driving you? Anytime you wake up in the morning, what is your focus? That is also what the Bible calls your spirit. It's not only that, you know, you know like um, that born again part of you, like the way we talk about it. No. If you wake up in the morning and your drive in life is that I must hammer, you know, our Nigerian English. I must make it materially. You will give, if you give your life to Christ, and listen, let me say this again. That is why once I was reading Genesis and I realized that God, after when he was creating that Genesis chapter one, the Bible says he separated what? Light from darkness. The, this is the application of it. Light can be present. It doesn't mean darkness has gone. Light can be present. It does not mean darkness has gone. That is why we have a duty as believers to be careful, to deliberately separate light from darkness. Many people became born again. They gave their lives to Christ. They were received into the kingdom, into the church. But, you know, remember the, what is the name of that fellow? Simon the sorcerer. Are you getting my point? What did Peter say about him? He said that you are still in the goal of bitterness. This is the Bible. This, let's read it. This is a man that the Bible says also believed. Acts chapter 8. Uh, well, just to get it um, in full context, let's start from verse 4. Now, those who had been scattered abroad went about preaching the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and began preaching Christ to them. The crowds with one accord were giving attention to what was said by Philip as they heard and saw the signs which he was performing. For in the case of many who had unclean spirits, they were coming out of them shouting with a loud voice. Now, notice the word unclean spirits. That's another way of this, using the word spirit. Here was referring to demons, personalities. Do you understand? Individuals, spiritual beings that were re residing inside people. So in the case of many who had unclean, unclean spirits, they were coming out of them shouting with a loud voice. And many who had been paralyzed and lame were healed. So there was much rejoicing in the city. Now, there was a man named Simon who formerly was practicing magic in the city and astonishing the people of Samaria, claiming to be someone great. And they all, from smallest to greatest, were giving attention to him. For time's sake, I'm just going to jump a few lines. In verse 11, now verse 12, but when they believed Philip, preaching the good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were being baptized, men and women alike. They were being baptized. Even Simon himself believed. Did he believe? Yes. Who said he believed? You or me? Huh? The scriptures now. Luke wrote it in the book of Acts was here. That the man also believed. <laughs> so you see, even Simon himself believed and was he baptized? Yes. Was he baptized? Yes, sir. He was baptized. You're following the point. <laughs> After being baptized, he continued on with Philip. He might enter into the ministry. He so believed, he began to preach too. He joined Philip. He continued on with Philip. And as he observed signs and great miracles taking place, he was constantly amazed. This is a man who has believed. This is a man who has been baptized. This is a man who has joined Philip in ministry. Now, let's see what the Bible says concerning the same person. So, so you understand, some of our doctrines are not totally accurate. And that's why we have a lot of confusion in our practices. Now, you see, now, if you read from verse 14, we will not read, we will not read all of that from verse 14. Peter and John came and ministered the Holy Spirit to people. And verse 18. Now when Simon saw that the Spirit was bestowed upon through the laying on of hands, laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money, saying, Give this authority to me as well, so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. 
But Peter said to him, May your silver perish with you, because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have no part or portion in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. Did he believe? Ah. Uh-uh. Is that Peter was not there? Okay, Peter was not there when he believed. It was Peter. It was Philip that baptized him. Maybe that was us confusing Peter. No. Peter knew. He worked with Jesus for a long time. He understood the way these things worked. And he said, oh boy, even though you are in church, your heart is not right before God. Therefore, repent of this wickedness of yours and pray that if possible, the intention of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see, now this is where I'm going, word of knowledge operating now, understanding, discernment operating now with true Peter. He said, for I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bondage of iniquity. A man who has believed. This same person will be taught your spirit is pure, you know, just quieting your ears and then your heart and anything that comes out of your spirit. (laughs) Peter said, a man who is in the bondage of bitterness You know, I read my Bible. Read, read through. Most of the people that gave Paul problems were Christians, baptized believers. Alexander the Coppersmith did me much evil, baptized Christian. May God repay him according to his work, a church member, elder. Someone wanted preeminence. John said, if you don't do what they say, they, they, was it, who said it? Was it John or, or James? Was it John that said it? that one man? Yes, I think it's John. That said, light preeminence. Harassing everybody. Spreading iniquity inside church. Church leader. Some of our doctrines need to be modified. This is a man who has believed. Peter said concerning him, I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bondage of iniquity. Let me just stop here. Now, why, why I read all of this is to let us understand something again. What was Simon supposed to do? Did he have light now? Now, answer me. Did he have light? Yes. Answer me. Yes. You are not sure? Yes. The man believed. He was baptized. Light had come to him. Unfortunately, darkness was not totally gone. That's what I was trying to explain. Even though he had believed, he was still in the goal of what? Bitterness. That thing was still driving him and pushing him. Many Christians believe they still love money. Jokes apart, especially when they give their lives to Christ, when a prosperity preacher was preaching. It's not the prosperity preacher's fault. The man who preached the gospel, he's just a prosperity preacher. So many people came to church still loving money. But we can see from here, okay, of course, we can just apply this from here. That many are still in the what? The goal, the bondage of covetousness. That's the point I'm trying to make in all of these things. Talking about your spirit. So when your spirit speaks, it doesn't just speak the word of God because it's coming from your spirit. No. What comes from your spirit is now the Holy Spirit can speak through there. I'm not saying it doesn't. But so can evil spirits. So can fleshly spirits. It is what is deeper, you know. You know that one I, I invented that word last week. It is what is what? Deeper most. <laughs> no, we have upper most. There is also deeper most. What is in the depths of the heart? That is what that is now propelling the individual. And whatever is there propelling you, deep inside your heart, many times you don't even know it is there. The Bible also uses the expression spirit for it. So you hear things of spirit of jealousy, spirit of anger. The man is quick to get angry. Is quick to get angry. There's a spirit of covetousness. In the same manner, he's only looking for, like they say, he has dollar signs in his eyes. Naira signs, everything. How does it turn to money? <laughs> Because I've, I've listened to Ken Higgins so much, there are so many of his stories. 
told the story of one man that was helping him out once in ministry. A minister. So he said, well, let's go around preaching together. He said that fellow was always coming up with schemes to make money. He said, they said, of course, trying to ma manage money, they'll go and do a program. Here and the guy will share a room. So at night, he's trying to sleep so they can wake up during the night and pray and study. As he's lying, lying there, the guy will say, Ken, are you still awake? He tries to pretend like, he's trying to pretend like he's, he's asleep, but what can you do? The man says, are you awake? He says, yes. He said, you know that reverend that came yesterday, do you reckon you have any money? Everything, will you have any money? <laughs> It's always checking how they can make money from their programs. After a while, he and the man fell apart. They couldn't continue together. And this man was an ordained minister too. You see, everything the man wanted, oh, do you think I'll make any money from that? No, the, everything to him was money, money, money. That's the same spirit a man like Simon the sorcerer had. And so, if he lies down and he prays and he prays and everything around him goes quiet, hmm? It is what he's seeking deep inside his heart that will speak to him. The Bible says transgression speaks to the wicked in his heart. That is, these things they speak. Unfortunately, when we don't understand, because of the way the voice just rises from the depths of our heart, you know what we will say? It's my spirit. So we see a girl, a young, good, fine Christian Mommy or fellowship style, you know, you know, those kind of people that on campus, hey, shama, mama, mama, that's how they greet you in the morning. They are so spiritual. Only those prayer warring brothers, evangelism leaders, can think that God spoke to them that they should propose to that kind of person. Yet, now what I'm telling you is a real story. One day you will hear that this girl is getting married. And she will marry somebody that everybody apart from her knows is an unbeliever. And when you ask her, I say, oh girl, what happened? She said, my spirit. And you can't argue because in the day you met her, she had been spiriting. <laughs> everything, everything has been her spirit. When you see her hair, you want to say, ah, sis, your hair is fine, no? He said, you know, when I was going to the salon, my spirit said... I should do this style. Oh, does she go to the salon? People like her know. What is she looking for there? The things of the world. When I went to the plating joint, yeah, that's where she will go. I was, I was just praying. I was just praying. I was just praying. And then, then I, I, I sit where I saw in the spray, two angels passed and they had this hairstyle. Now I said, me, I do one. So the same person that tells you now, who are you to talk? I found out later she was not lying. Her spirit was speaking. Yes, her spirit was speaking. And her spirit said to her, Arise, my daughter. This is he that the Lord has sent. He doesn't believe. What oh, does it matter? Your spirit has spoken. If you look very closely, he's rich. If you look very closely, he's from the local government that her father likes. If you look very closely, all the four younger ones she has been thinking of how she will handle, this guy is going to handle everything. If you look very closely, that was what was speaking to her. That was why after they cast lots and everything to choose a replacement for Judas, Peter said in prayer, God, you are the only one that knows the heart of all men. Tell us who of these two that you have chosen. Because only God knew the hearts of people. No matter how spiritual this person looked, only God knew her heart. What was inside her heart, the rest of you did not know that Simon the sorcerer was living there. She prophesied all these years with Simon the sorcerer still there. And many believers, that is a problem we have. Listen to me. Simon was not a bad man because he believed. It's there. And when you see, when Peter finished railing on him, he didn't get angry. That's letting you know he was not a bad man. He didn't get angry. What did he say? He said, pray for me yourselves, so that nothing of what you have said may come upon me. He wasn't a bad person. When, we say, when the Bible says he believed, he really believed. 
After believing he, he was still in the gall of bitterness. After believing there were still evil things in his heart. That's what I meant when I said the Bible, God said concerning creation, that he had to now come and separate what? Light from darkness. Every one of us need to learn to separate light from darkness. I hope you're getting my point here. So many things that we say, my spirit spoke. Don't be impressed with that. Because many people's spirits that spoke that confused you. It was other things that had polluted the spirit that was speaking to them. Those things spoke and it was clear in their ears. It's my spirit. But like I said, part of the problem is that we didn't realize that when you use the word spirit, it's not only that seed of God that's lying around there. Bitterness often lies there. People don't know. So they make statements, they make judgments. They don't realize that they are bitter. They don't realize that somebody that they are angry with, the anger is still there. And that's why I began this evening by saying, one question you must ask yourself, what is the most important thing to you? What really are you looking for in life? Because what you are looking for in life, that is actually what congeals into your spirit and starts speaking, speaking up to you. When God came to speak to um, Solomon, it was in a dream. Solomon didn't get up physically. He was lying down there. Solomon, you know, the normal daily activities were gone. Whatever Solomon asked God for that time was, was what was deep, remember our English? Was what was deepermost in his heart. And that's why God came to him at that time. Nobody confused him that morning. The bandit you drove past couldn't affect him. Maybe all the kings from uh, Egypt, from Syria, all the kings from around, they came. The king of the Ammonites, Edomites, they came to greet him that day. And they came with royal vehicles, gold everywhere. That was not going to affect him. That was a day's encounter. What was inside there, what was deeper most in his heart, was what spoke up when the Lord appeared to him in a dream. The man was asleep. Let's put it like this. His spirit man rose and spoke. You are getting the point I'm making here? So the question, therefore, is that what is it that is driving you? That's the question every Christian must ask himself, ask herself. You know, when people are arguing sometimes about doctrines, I've learned, there's a way I say it, that if an adult tells you 2 plus 2 is equal to 5, don't argue. Don't quarrel. An adult comes and tells you 2 plus 2 is equal to 5. You know he knows it is 4. So how come in his own situation it is 5? And we have gotten into arguments before, morning, afternoon, and evening. On 2 plus 2 is 4, he said, no, it is 5. Ah, excuse me, sir. You bring out the crown. You know, did you learn to count with crown? Uh-huh. Or sticks. 1, 2, one, two, then you mix it together. Did you do mixing together? As if that mixing was necessary to get the right figure. You count it for the man. He will look at the four and say, one, two, three, four, five. I learned long ago, there's no point arguing. He has a fifth one that you don't know about. He does. He's counting it. And what's that fifth one? That fifth one is that he has checked the result of agreeing that two plus two is four. And he does not like the result. For that reason, he cannot accept that 2 plus 2 is 4. The, the, the implications are too many. He can't live with the implication. So he keeps arguing with you, putting scriptures here and there. You are arguing on things that are so clear from scriptures. But the man will never agree. As far as he's concerned, 2 plus 2 must be equal to 5. Now, that's how people live life. Now, this, this, this is what I'm going to explain. Whatever we are looking for in life affects what we hear. Affects what we understand. Now, what am I saying all of this? I'm saying all of this so let's all understand. So when people now start telling you their spirit, their spirit, their spirit, know what is pushing them. Many times, it's those things that are pushing people and exactly means their spirit. This is the main thing we are trying to say. Let's get back to where we began reading from. Where do we start from? 1 Corinthians chapter 4, yes. He said, let a man so consider us as servants of Christ, and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found what? 
faithful. You know, I don't know who said this, but one man of God says something. Say people talk about mansion in heaven. Maybe there are mansions he doesn't know. Whatever be the crown they are given in heaven, he said he really doesn't care about it. He said what's most important to him is one thing. That one day he will see the Lord. And the Lord will say to him, well done, good and faithful servant. He said that's all the reward he needs. That statement. The Lord brings out the hand and says, shake my hand. Well done, good and faithful servant. What am I teaching? I'm teaching that for believers, that is what we should be going for. You've heard me say it again and again. I don't believe in the, 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 the gospel of success. I don't believe in it. I, I totally don't believe in it. But my reason is that how do you define success? How do you define success? Isaiah preached and preached and preached and said, I've spent my strength for nothing and for vanity. Jeremiah preached, nobody believed him. Jeremiah said so much. He said, what did the word, God, word of God bring for me? You know what Jeremiah said? He said, it brought, it brought for me enmity. My friends left me. I became a name like, ah, he's coming. People are just, as Jeremiah is approaching. He said, hey, okay, we'll see tomorrow now. They will disappear. They will scatter. Why? Jeremiah is approaching. Listen. In South Korea, Brother Young Cho, he built the largest single congregation in the world. Jeremiah built the smallest congregation in the world. He was not liked by people. So bad. You know, at a point in time, Jeremiah said something. He said, now this word has now become a source of shame, a source of derision, a source of enmity for me. So what am I going to do? I won't say anything again. I will no longer preach. So he went to one and said, a man of God, anything, he said, nothing. God is not speaking again. Leave it. Then he lay down at night. And the pressure in his soul would not let him sleep. He said the word became like fire shot up in my bones. So he came out again and began to prophesy. If he wanted to count congregation, Jeremiah didn't have. He didn't build a big church. What about Ezekiel? Ah, Ezekiel had a big church. Ezekiel's church was big. They were always expanding. They were always expanding. And then Ezekiel, people would gather and say, oh boy. Were you in service last time? No. The rhymes that pastor brought from heaven. He said, if you can see the invisible, you will do the impossible. He said, eh? He said, perspire to acquire the desire that you admire. <laughs> and don't retire, but refire. He said, oh boy, they go, George. <laughs> His church kept on enlarging. Then God called him Jeremiah and then Ezekiel. He said, not one of them is doing what you say. He said to them, you are an entertainer. He said, they come to you as people come. They say, let's go and hear the word from the mouth of the pastor. Yeah, of course, that one prophet. He said, but what do they do? He said, they hear your words, they don't do them. He said, you are nothing but a man who sings well and plays skillfully on an instrument. Basically, Ezekiel was seen by the Israelites as an entertainer. What do you call success? Nobody followed Jeremiah. They didn't like him. Ezekiel, they liked him. He, the guy was handsome. Everybody followed him. Once he's doing Holy Ghost Night, ooh, everybody's there. But God called, God called him and said, oh boy, don't deceive yourself. Not one of them is believing what you are saying. That's why I don't like that. So God, the gospel of success. Should we go to Revelations again for time's sake? We open it. You can read Revelation chapter 3. The one we quote all the time, the church in Smyrna, uh, in uh, Laodicea. Rich church. They will just come and say, oh, we're expanding that direction because we need to redo that wall. The wall we used before was made with Dangote cement. We now found this important cement. We'll break it down. We'll redo it. We'll now tile it. Every idea they had, they had money to carry it out. If they hear a man say, oh, this guy preaches West in America, fly him down. They had money. Let us pray. Say, what are we praying about, brethren? Can I pray about something else? Brethren, write your checks. They write the check. Why pray when there's money? But Jesus looked at them and shook his head. Because they were bragging. We are rich. We have need of nothing. But Jesus said, you don't realize that you are what? You are poor. You are wretched. You are blind. You are naked. 
You are miserable, yes. Thank you. Those are the words he used to describe a very rich church. How do you define success? That's the point I'm making. How do you define it? There was another church a few verses before in chapter 2. The church in Smyrna, that one, that one, nothing. The floor of the church was not cemented. The roof was leaking. Car, car park, what are you parking? <laughs> nothing. They were known for poverty. And Jesus looked at them. He said, I know of your poverty. He said, but let me let you into a secret. Actually, you are rich. So how do you define success? This is the interesting part. The church in Laodicea was not being persecuted. Go and read it too. They were rich. Governor would come there for Thanksgiving. There was no persecution. The commissioner of police was a member. Who wanted to persecute them? Who would persecute them? The church was popular. That's why they felt, look, people were doing business there every day. But the church in Smyrna, this interesting part, they were poor. Then God now said they're about to be tested. I don't know whether you're getting my point. In the midst of poverty, temptation will now join. Wait in now. Listen, if you want to be Christians, let's be Christians. We have to learn to value life the way Jesus does. And you know why God was treating them like that? He said, he that bears fruit, I will prune, so that he can bear more fruit. Now that they be faithful, you are sending us to prison, we should be faithful. You are giving money to the church in Laodicea, we should be faithful. What about those ones in Laodicea? But God warned those ones, I'm about to take away your candle. Many times when churches will scatter, it's because God has been warning them for years. But what we're seeing from outside, man, if you get to that church parking lot, the pastor's car alone eh, is enough for you to give your life to Christ. You heard that kind of thing before? Nonsense. <laughs> Jesus said, these are churches I'm about to close. That next week you'll come here, they won't be there anymore. They will now go to, uh, to, uh, to, the news, to social media and start protesting. They want to Islamize Nigeria. That's why the churches are closing down. It's because of Islamic agenda. Jesus said, Islamic agenda cannot survive where I am. The reason why you are closing is that I remove your candle. That's why I'm not into this issue of uh, success. You know what? You are preaching. What do you have to show for it? You know what Paul, you know what Paul said? He said, don't judge anything until the end. It's only Jesus that knows what is going on. So don't tell me somebody does not know what, have anything to show. Just because he gets to the church, he has been in the town for some time. He doesn't have a 5,000-member congregation. And his last bed, they did not gather money to buy him the latest GL 550. Do you know there are preachers who have left this city and ran to Abuja? Sometimes you ask believers. That's, that's, what, that's what I'm preaching about this evening. That what are you looking for? Success as a pastor is not counted in the size of the congregation. It's not. It is not counted in the, the beauty of your pulpit. So we got, we got a designer from Los, Los Angeles to come and look at it. And then, oh, wow, the glory of God is on his rubbish. His glory. Some of these we celebrate. If, if only you will see what Jesus is saying about them. The way the Lord Jesus judges success is not the way the world judges it. So what I'm telling, telling to, preaching to Christians is, listen, what God wants from you is faithfulness. It's not worldly success. It's not. You can't live, you know, people are, oh God. Many people have, have, have now listen, you can be thinking of somebody in your mind. I'm not thinking of people, really. I know I'm a human being too, so I may be tempted to think of somebody. But I'm not preaching about anybody to you. The loss is my heart. But many people have left Enugu because Abuja is sweet. Lagos is sweet. Listen, let me pray one prayer for you. When you are going your own way, may you not succeed in it. Amen. Say amen. No. Yeah. Hmm. If God said be in Enugu and you park and somebody drags you to Portacot, 
May you fail in Port Harcourt if God didn't send you there. You know why? Because when your problems begin, is when you get there and you start succeeding. You will now turn around and say, I said so. The moment we move down here, breakthrough. As soon as we came to this city, the city opened to us. You don't know that Laodicea has swallowed you. You are coming from Smyrna. Are you getting my point? Paul was in Smyrna. Demas did not like Smyrna. So he went to where? Laodicea. <laughs> Yeah, that's what happened. And you get there suddenly, as soon as you arrive, Pastor, you're welcome. Is this your car? He said, yes. Ah, sir, we don't drive this kind of car here. So four brothers in church say, no, the Lord spoke to us. To say to you. The quickest one they can find for you is a Hyundai, maybe Veracruz. Say, Pastor, please, just money. Normally our pastor uses a GL550, but you see, it takes us a while, so... And then he said, ah, and I was in the new guy. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he like, he like, like somebody said, <laughs> this is ministry. So one man, after, you know, after preaching, they went after, you know, went to the big man of God's house. They now served food. He chose finished. He said, ha, ah, this is ministry. <laughs> The big man looked at him and said, my friend, this is not minutes, this is food. We are just <laughs> Listen, if a place where God didn't send you becomes comfortable, you're in trouble. It's more difficult to retrace your steps. Oh, it's more difficult, it's more difficult. That's why I said you should say amen to that prayer that I prayed, because it's important. But if you get there, the first day you arrive, Mopo slap you. You know, you will look like What? Is if you talk, I shoot you. Hey, no, I'm not talking about life. <laughs> Close your mouth. You know, you know, instantly you will go home. Say, the Lord is not with me here. <laughs> Next day you are going back to Enugu. Next day. Like one day, Pastor Corey said something once. Is it easy to preach to you today? If you know Pastor Corey does, he's a sharp, sharp dresser. We we're in school together. Always looking clean. So I can imagine, say, one day. He shined his father's car he used to drive that time. And shined his own shirt. Shined everything. I was driving Bini, going to meet a business contact. Then he stopped in the, ho- in the hold up. Then one madman came to his window <laughs> and spat on him. <laughs> you know, a lunatic just came. And spat on him. He said initially he wanted to get angry. Then he stopped being angry. He turned the car and went back home, removed his shirt, and started planning to go to Sokoto. He said, this is a sign that I have stayed too long here. That the thing in my heart that said I should move over to Sokoto and go and start ministry there, I've left it behind. He didn't leave that day, but he started planning. And a few months after that, he was gone. What was it that pushed him? I'm, I didn't, he didn't look for trouble. Though. He was somebody just came to the window. Just look, look, look. <laughs> he read the spiritual sign. That to him it was a spiritual sign. He said, "No, this something is wrong. This is not the place of my rest. It is polluted." That's why that, I pray that prayer for people. Because many times people don't understand what success is. Success is. They look at somebody. I mean, ministry. Min- oh, this min- for those who are in ministry, it's very interesting. Church people can look, they will just frustrate you. If you don't know where to look, a man will enter ministry before you. He will pack and say, ah, man of God, how are you? Let me give you a lift. You know why he's giving you a lift? You say you don't have a serious car. The one you have is with Udechuku. Ude carried it two days ago, three days ago. And he's calling you, Pastor. Tie roads are bad. Say, I'm coming. You are still praying. That's why you're in Keke now. And the man you baptized, anointed, taught the rudiments of the gospel. He stops. He says, ah, this is your car. is fine. He says, yeah, it was my, my, my birthday last week. The church people bought it for me. And you are thinking, these wicked people in this Enugu. You start getting angry for nothing. You start, your spirit starts start saying that the will of God is after a place becomes dry, Elijah will move. Move from the brook because the brook is now dry. dry. And he's going to Abuja. Why? The, your spirit will say go. You know Why? 
Because the man you baptized, the man you taught the rudiments of the gospel, he went to Abuja and normal birthday, somebody dashed him such a sharp ride. And you're there preaching all this way. <laughs> you now start getting angry that the problem with the Nugu is that coal is under, so the house of people are dark. <laughs> all kinds of revelations. No, you will start getting all kinds of revelations. One day, a man said, look, what I want to tell you, not a joke. You know, there are things you hear. <laughs> Let, look, believers, listen to me. Make sure you are seeking the Lord, that the only thing you want is to be pleasing to him. A man of God, not today, which year are we in? 2019. This story I'm telling you is more than five years ago. He said, on a normal Sunday, Pastor Murphy, don't get angry what I'm about to tell you. <laughs> on a normal Sunday after service, any day he gets personal offering of three million naira, he will go and check his message, whether it was a bad message. That three million naira? What did I say that offended people? <laughs> That's a bad Sunday, three million. Not 2019. Then instead of more than five, six years ago. Pastor finishes preaching at the end of the day. Sir, I was blessed. I was blessed. I was blessed. Just in his office, I was blessed, put it there. I was blessed, put it there. I was blessed. <laughs> he said if he totals the money after service and it's less than three million naira, or it's three million naira and less, his consent. His consent that what did I preach that is wrong? Which means there are days it's five, there are days it is six. It's normal one hour service, maximum two, two of it. Those are the kind of things some people will hear. After preaching in one place for a long time, they say, no, something is wrong. And listen to me, then their spirits start telling them things. So let me, get, let me summarize my message so we can close. Listen to this. What I'm preaching this evening is this. For you ask yourself a question. One, that is two things I'm saying. First, ask yourself a question. What really am I looking for? Number two, which is the main message, make sure that what is most important to you is that you are pleasing to the Lord as a faithful servant. Every other thing is not important. The size of the church is not a big deal. Listen, those things are not primary important things. Isaiah said, I have spent my strength for nothing and for vanity. That's how a man can be discouraged. What's most important is you look back. Did we break the laws of God? Did we show ourselves lazy? Did God open doors we refuse to step into them? Once you have satisfied yourself with all of these things, you leave the rest to God. That's how it works. We said last time, which country should I go? Which country should I stay in? Ask yourself, where can I contribute? Where am I needed? The age at which you built a house does not say anything about whether you are succeeding or failing. It doesn't. It doesn't. If they ask many of us preachers today, let's talk about Paul. Who, and so who do you want to be like? Do you want to be like Paul? We all put up our hands. But we don't mean it. We don't mean it. Because if they, if they sit us down and show us what it means to be like Paul, we will change our minds. Though. Because Paul didn't have a bishop's court. There was no personage for Paul. The only time he had his own house that we know of is prison. Paul, no, really. Paul used to move up and down. He would go to Ephesus and teach for three years. At the end of the day, he said, I know you will not see my face anymore. The church is not his own. He built a very big church, established it, and said to them, you will not see my face anymore. Do you think we really want to be like most of us don't want to be? Who wants to be shipwrecked? Even me preaching. I don't want to be shipwrecked. No, I won't lie to you. What is the big deal? Who, who likes to be shipwrecked? Why? Lord, please, I don't want to be shipwrecked. It's true. But God says, if you want, you know, two people came one day, James and uh, John. They said to the Lord, we want to sit on your left and on your right. <laughs> Jesus said, be careful the kind of thing you ask for. Be very, very careful. 
You want to sit on my left and my right? Let me tell you the prerequisite. You will drink the cup I'm about to drink. That cup, you will drink it too. You know, he said, he said, are you able? Next time they ask you a question, you don't know the answer. Say, I don't know the answer. The two boys said, we are able. <laughs> How can you be able to drink what you have not seen before? You know, I don't understand for human beings. When people have desires, they just confuse them. One day, I was talking to one guy who wanted to go abroad. He hasn't gone, thank God for his life. We're describing some things, some challenges. He said, let's reach there first. I said, you're a fool. They are telling the challenges. He said, let's reach there first. See, that's when things have blocked you. you know? When, you know, the desires, that's what I'm talking about. When people's desires have blocked their eyes, that's when they make such statements. Let's just reach there first. There are places you get to and you can't come back. Are you aware of that? We're just trying to explain to the man, look, look at the issues, look at challenges. Say, hey, let's get there first. What's the point I'm making? Listen, ask yourself, what really am I looking for in life? That's what I'm saying. What really am I looking for in life? And as Christians, this is what we must be looking for. To be found faithful. To be found faithful. Remember we said wanted. God wants people that he can count on. One of the things that God wants, you know, the reference explains something. Very, very beautiful. He said he was describing what it means to be a slave of Christ. That most people these days can't understand the concept, do you understand? That when you are being, when you are somebody's slave, now follow this, the fellow does with you whatever he wants. That when slaves are sold, okay? Let, let's use the word lock. Slaves have different kinds of locks. Some become house slaves. You go to a rich man's house, a kind man, he just wants somebody to cook his food. He wants somebody to you know, make his bed, take care of his children, and all of that, that slave will just enjoy. The fellow is still a slave. But a slave will go to another house sometimes. Man, you go to a man's house, a bad man. He's broke. So he sent, listen, he literally will turn his female slave to a prostitute. And she can't say anything. He was trying to explain what it means to be the slave of Christ. I mean, an issue here. Of course, we have a good Lord. Somebody say amen. amen. We have a good Lord. But this is what he wants us to understand also. He does with us what he likes. And we must learn to be content with that. We must, that is, your desire in life should be, I must be found pleasing. I must be found pleasing. I must live my life that at the end of life, I look back, have I pleased God or have not? That is what must be important to us. Listen to me, Christians. Any other thing you pursue outside this, you are setting yourself up for failure. You will fail. The world may not think so. But as a matter of fact, it is called failure. The problem we have is that the world wants to set a standard for us. And people start pursuing it. So anything they hear, they are using that thing to pursue the standard that the world has set for them. It's in their hearts. People say they want to do ministry. They don't really want to do ministry. For them, it's another job. It's a well-paying job. He has a, he has a career path. One day, you are going to become a general overseer of some sort. And then, you will settle. Your children are settled. And that is what we come into ministry to do. Other times, some people are not like that. They just feel like, and, and they feel very righteous. They're not like that. They feel very righteous. I'm not like that. I am not like that. Before I go into that ministry? Nah. I'm not looking for anybody's money. So what am I going to do first? I will establish businesses. So that when I start preaching, everybody will know I did not come here to look for money. And I will have enough money to be meeting all my needs. I know what they sound very, very what? Righteous, spiritual. That these are the good ones. But you know what? As far as God is concerned, him and the other one, they are the same. Why? Because he must have his security. That is important to him. So what is he pursuing in life? Security. Such people are also not useful for what God wants to do. They are also not useful. Because what is more important to them is not what God wants them to do, but how safe they will be while they are doing it. 
That's my message for today. I don't have much to say. But for all of us to ask ourselves, what really are we looking for in life? Are we seeking our own, you know, which was the, what, the, what Paul you use now? Are we, seeking, are we seeking our own? Yes, that's the, word to put, the way to put it. Are we seeking our own or we are seeking the things of the Lord? And when you are seeking the things of God, listen to me, they are not always nice. That's the point I'm making. When God met, when Jesus met Paul, you know the first thing he told Paul? He said, he showed him the things that he will suffer for his sake. There were two questions that Paul asked the Lord. Remember, we talked about it, was it last year or the year before? We must never forget. Everybody must ask that question. Two questions. What was the first one? Who are you, Lord? What's the second one? What do you want me to do? That's the word. The, the whole of life is centered around those two questions. Who are you, Lord? And what do you want me to do? Listen to me. Not what do you want me to have. Not what will you give me. The problem we have more, a lot of times, Christians, we have tied service to reward. So when we are serving, what we will re, what we'll be rewarded with is what is primary in our hearts. Thank you for tuning in for today's broadcast. I believe that the Lord spoke to you through those words. Uh, today's broadcast was a production of Kingdom World Ministries, a non-denominational teaching ministry based in Enugu, Nigeria. And it was brought to you on the bill of friends and co-workers of the ministry. To get more messages like you heard today, and including today's message, please go to the website pastor.ng. There you will find hundreds of messages, books, different sermons, and tracts that we have compiled over time. They are all available for your edification. Please, if today's broadcast was a blessing to you, send us a mail. I would like to read your testimony. The email address is right now on the screen. Copy it and send us a mail so that we will know what God is doing in your life through this broadcast. This program will come up again same time next week, and I'm looking forward to you being around with us. And when you are doing that, please invite your friends and your loved ones to join in with you. And until that time, may the Lord be with you.